Our first presenter tonight will be Elizabeth Betta Broad. She recently joined Catskill Mountain Keeper uh, to coordinate the Community Fracking Defense Project. This is a joint initiative of Catskill Mountain Keeper and the Natural Resources Defense Council. For the past two years, she has worked as an organizer with Frack Action and the New Yorkers Against Fracking Coalition. Before that, Betta was a deputy director of Earth Day New York, organizing the major Earth Day events in Manhattan and coordinating other Earth Day educational programs. She graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Fairfield University with a BA in political science and studied at, new, at the New Schools graduate program in international affairs. She's a native of New York City and she says she's excited to relocate to New York's southern tier. I asked her if she'd seen our winners yet. <laughs> I look forward to hearing what she has to say. Uh, another of our presenters will be John Croyce. He's a legal fellow with the Natural Resources Defense Council, the New York program, and a member of NRDC's newly launched Community Fracking Defense Project. He joined NRDC in September 2012 after graduating law school earlier that year. Before joining NRDC, John worked with the Columbia Law School Environmental Law Clinic to provide advice to citizens groups on environmental issues, including the air impacts of natural gas development in Pennsylvania and local land use authority over gas drilling in New York. John is a graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and of Columbia Law School. He's a native of North Carolina. He's called New York home for the last four years. And last, we have Daniel Rochelle. He's a project attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council New York program and NRDC's newly launched Community Fracking Defense Project. Prior to joining NRDC in September 2011, Mr. Rochelle worked on local community issues related to gas drilling in the Columbia Law School Environment Law Clinic, where among other things, he helped counsel municipalities in Pennsylvania on the formation of ordinances limiting or excluding fracking. Mr. Rochelle is a graduate of Cornell University and Columbia Law School and he was a beer vendor at Wrigley Field in Chicago. I would like to have that job. Okay, a lot of you have been at events here and have seen me moderate before. I always ask for civility uh, and patience and treat everybody with respect no matter their uh, views on this issue. Thank you so much, Bob, for that introduction and for emceeing tonight. And thank you all for being here. It's wonderful that you would choose to spend the first beautiful evening that we've had in a few days in this auditorium uh, with us. So we're really delighted and honored that you could be here. And also thanks so much to our organizers tonight. They did an amazing job, especially Maureen Dill, thank you, and Ellen Pope, and of course Bob, and a lot of other folks who were involved in making tonight happen. So I just want to express my gratitude for that. And as Bob said, I recently came on board with Catskill Mountain Keeper, which is an environmental organization that is based in the Catskills, but has been working to stop fracking from starting in New York State for the past five years. And I was really thrilled to join the team with Catskill Mountain Keeper and in particular focus my organizing energy in the Southern Tier because this is the front lines of fracking. <clears throat> While hydraulic fracturing would end up impacting the entire state and country and world, um, I think we all know that folks here are going to be hit hardest first. And it's such a beautiful place to be. And just driving today from Barker, where I was meeting with a sheep farmer turned fractivist, I was struck by just how unbelievably gorgeous the landscape is. And so I can appreciate you know, how much you want to protect this way of life, because uh, it really is incredible. So I'm new to the area, but very happy to be here. And I'm working with my colleagues at the NRDC, which is short for the Natural Resources Defense Council. And we have this joint initiative, uh, the Community Fracking Defense Project, which is basically seeking to provide support and assistance to communities that are looking for added protections. Uh, basically, one thing that we're doing is building on the work of the attorneys, Helen and David Slotchy, who some of you may have heard of. They're a dynamic duo that have working with 
grassroots activists all over the state have managed to pass uh, many moratoriums and bans. And so we're looking to really continue to build and support that work and hoping to work with some of you uh, in this area if you're looking for that kind of support, which Hopefully you are. Um, I would just want to show you real quick this map, which it, you can find on fracktracker.org. And uh, it's spell, spelled F-R-A-C-T, so not F-R-A-C-K, like we usually spell fracking. Um, just F-R-A-C-T and then tracker. So fracktracker.org. Um, you can find these maps of New York State and that shows all of the places that moratoriums and bans have passed. And when you look at it, it's so exciting because you can see that we have over 100 moratoriums, over 50 bans, and so it's totally possible to do this. Uh, it's not easy, but we're here to help. And, you know, in any way that I can provide support, um, you know, I know, again, I know it's not easy and it's controversial in a lot of communities, but... I think we all know how important it is to keep fighting it and keep our state safe from this dangerous practice. So again, thank you for having me. And thank you for having us. And I'm going to now turn it over to my colleague, Dan Rochelle. Hi. Um, so as Betta said, my name is Dan Rochelle. I'm an attorney here with um, the Natural Resources Defense Council and part of the Community Fracking Defense Project team, along with Betta and John and Kate Sending, who couldn't make it here tonight because uh, she is tending to a husband recovering from surgery. And um, we, you know, we're all wishing him a quick and speedy recovery. Um, what we're going to talk about here tonight is uh, three things. We're going to give sort of a general overview of the Community Fracking Defense Project. We're going to talk a little bit about our work in New York and then we're gonna open it up to questions. So first off, uh, the Community Fracking Defense Project. It's, it's kind of a long name, it's uh, four letters, but what is it that the Community Fracking Defense Project actually does? Well, what we strive to do is strengthen communities' rights to protect themselves from the harms of industrial fracking. And we do this predominantly through, to, through three means. Um, the first component of our work, the first major component, is working on legislation. And this happens both at the state and the local levels. So at the state level, we work with state legislatures in order to enact legislation that increases the scope of municipal authority to deal with issues regarding fracking. And then at the local level, we work directly with municipalities to pass ordinances regarding fracking, usually bans or moratoria. Um, the second major component to our work is litigation, which is by far probably the most fun for me and John. And again, there's two components here. It's both defending municipalities when their authority is under attack, either by industry or by the state. And it is also working proactively either with municipalities or though more often with community groups or community members to um, uh, exercise their rights and to protect their rights when those rights are being infringed either by a government actor or by industry. And then the last major component of our work is sort of information dissemination and we found this to be hugely important because really it's, it's folks in the local communities who know what's going on, who know what's happening on the ground and if people who are living in communities that might be affected by fracking don't know what their rights are, they don't know what the law is, they're less likely to be able to identify the action steps that they can take, and they're less likely to act. And last but not least, we work in five states. We work in Pennsylvania, Illinois, Ohio, North Carolina, oh, I'm sorry, six states. We're now working in California as well. And um, most importantly, and that's why it's the largest on the slide, um, for the purposes of tonight's conversation, New York. I should also mention that we also do some advisory work in, in Michigan and Colorado as well. So moving on to our work in New York. Um, initially, when we started working on, on local community issues regarding fracking in New York, it was in the context of the Dryden and Middlefield cases. And for folks who don't know um, what those cases are about, they involve two towns, the towns of Dryden and Middlefield, both of which enacted ordinances completely banning oil and gas drilling from within town boundaries. Those ordinances were challenged by industry as being superseded by state law. 
Uh, those challenges went to New York's lowest court, which is confusingly called the Supreme Court. Um, we got involved at the Supreme Court level. Um, we were represented by Earth Justice, both Catskill Mountain Keeper and NRDC, and Earth Justice submitted an amicus brief on our behalf in support of the both Dryden and Middlefield in support of their right to enact those ordinances. We won at the Supreme Court level. Both of those cases were appealed to the third department. And at that point, Earth Justice was representing the town of Dryden directly. So NRDC stepped in and wrote the amicus brief on behalf of a number of environmental organizations, including Catskill Mountain Keeper. And I am pleased to say, as of a few short weeks ago, um, we were also victorious in the appellate court in the third department. So the law of the land, at least for the time being, is that municipalities do have the right, do have the power to enact these bans and moratoria. Um, beyond our work with uh, the Dryden and Middlefield cases, uh, we find ourselves working mostly directly with town boards and with community members and with community groups. And we find that our work um, varies greatly depending on the makeup of town boards and the attitude they take to what we're doing. So the first type of town board scenario that we work with, or we work in towns with very supportive town boards. And in, in those towns, we're working mostly uh, with town board members. We're working to pass legislation, which is usually bans moratoria or other types of ordinances that either um, uh, limit or exclude fracking. The next scenario that we work with are in towns where there are neutral town boards, town boards that aren't really active on the gas drilling issues. They don't really care. They think it's perhaps the purview of the state or of a state agency like the Department of Environmental Conservation. In these towns, we're working more with community members. Um, we work with them to sort of motivate their boards to take action or to help find them actions uh, that they can take to um, limit, inappropriate, limit or exclude inappropriate fracking activities that don't require board involvement. And the last type of uh, scenario that we work with, we do some work in towns that have pro-gas drilling boards, and the boards are so pro-gas drilling that sometimes they forget about the will of their constituents, sometimes they forget about the democratic process, and sometimes they even disregard the Constitution. Um, and so in those towns, we've done some work um, challenging undemocratic ordinances and undemocratic actions. Um, so I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna spend the rest of my time talking about our work with local legislation. And when you are passing a local legislation, a local ordinance or a local law relating to fracking, there are four main questions at issue. Uh, the first question is a pretty big one, and that is, can you pass an ordinance regarding fracking? And this again is the Dryden Middlefield cases, and the answer for the time being is yes. Um, at least with respect to bans and moratoria. Towns do have the authority to enact these ordinances. Um, the second question, the second major question is when you've decided to pass an ordinance, when you have the authority, what type of ordinance should you pass? And the question here, and the answer here is either a moratorium, a ban, or another type of ordinance that addresses the harms of fracking. Um, the, this is usually very, um, dependent on the wishes of the town. It tends to be very site specific and what people want in that community. The third major question is, once you've decided what type of ordinance you wanna pass, how should you pass that ordinance? There are a number of procedural rules in New York in terms of passing ordinances, and there's also some larger questions of whether you need to pass the ordinance using the police power or using the zoning power or which one is advantageous. And then the last question is, once you've passed the ordinance and once you've passed it appropriately, um, are you liable for what's known as a taking? And that is something that I'll discuss a little bit, um, a little bit further on. Um, it, but in, in short, it's just a scenario where the town would have to pay um, either landowners or mineral owners for the fair market value of their mineral rights. Um, so to sort of go into more depth on that first question and explore what the universe of municipal power is with respect to ordinances um, about gas drilling, you have to go to the source of municipal authority. And so municipal authority in New York, it's different in every state, municipal authority in New York actually comes from the New York Constitution. 
specifically um, Article 9, subsection C210, uh, where it states, every local government shall have the power to adopt and amend local laws not inconsistent with the provisions of this Constitution or any general law. And there's a number of areas in which municipalities can exercise have or have power, and one of those areas is with relation to the government protection, order conduct, safety, health, and well-beings of persons or property therein. So it's kind of a very large general grant of power. And through the years, the New York legislature um, has enacted a number of statutes relating to local government authority. Here are a few of them. Um, but one thing that I want to bring your attention to, and I brought it with the the red highlight, is that even within that grant of power from the Constitution, there is a very important caveat. And that caveat is that municipalities cannot enact an ordinance that is inconsistent with or conflicts with a general law of the state. And that is pretty much every law that the state passes. And the law that um, we are most concerned with right now is the New York oil, gas, and solution mining law. So the New York oil, gas, and solution mining law, as the name would suggest, is New York's law that regulates oil and gas drilling. Um, it also is the law that regulates fracking. And within the OGSML, as it's called, there is a provision specifically relating to municipal government authority and specifically overriding it. And the pro provision reads as follows. The provisions of this article of the oil and gas law, shall supersede, shall override all local laws or ordinances relating to the regulation of the oil, gas, and solution mining industry. So in, in the Dryden Middlefield cases, what industry was arguing is that this specific text, as well as sort of the general structure of the act, um, was w inconsistent with these two local bans, and therefore they were null and void and they had to be struck down by the court. Uh, luckily, th both the lower courts and the third department disagreed with that reasoning, and recently the third department held that they found nothing either in the structure of the act, either in, in the legislative history, or in the text of the act itself that would indicate an intention on the part of the legislator, legislature to use to usurp the authority traditionally delegated to municipalities to establish permissible and prohibited uses of land within their jurisdiction. And in a nutshell, one of the central issues that these cases centered on was the difference between the regulation of the oil and gas industries and the regulation of land use. If you look at the text of the oil and gas law, the only thing that's preempted is, are ordinances related to the regulation of the oil and gas industry. And what the court found is that type of regulation is geared towards the technical aspects of well production and completion. So the, the types of casings that you have to use, um, how you construct your drill rig, how you're disposing of waste on site, how you're uh, closing up the well site after everything is done. The regulation of land use, on the other hand, is something entirely different. It deals with a community's right to determine um, what type of development is consistent with community character and whether certain uses are compatible with an, one another, making sure that a use is not a, a nuisance to other uses in the community and making sure that that use is not a threat to other uses in the community. And because those are separate spheres of regulation, there was no preemption. Um, I should mention that um, industry has appealed the, the, the rulings in the Dryden and Middlefield cases, um, or I shouldn't say they've appealed, they are petitioning the um, Court of Appeals, which is New York's highest court, to hear the case. Because the decision was unanimous at the appellate court level, uh, the Court of Appeals does not have to take the case, it's discretionary. Um, and at this point, it's anybody's guess whether the court will take the case, although we're very confident that if the case goes up to the high court, that they will uphold um, the, the ruling of the lower courts and of the, um, of the appellate court because we feel um, those decisions are very well founded and very strong. This slide right here covers um, sort of the second two questions, sort of the what and the how, and I'm going to move through this kind of quickly because some of it is a little bit technical. Uh, but first I'll talk about general municipal law 
239M. This relates to the how of passing an ordinance in certain circumstances, including the passage of bans and moratoria. Um, ordinances have to be referred to the County Planning Department. The County Planning Department can either then reject that ordinance or make changes or approve it. But if they reject or make changes, the town cannot pass the ordinance inconsistent with those recommendations um, unless they pass it with a supermajority of the town board. And one important thing to note is that this only applies to ordinances passed pursuant to the zoning power, not to the police power. And to talk about the distinction between the police power and the zoning power, the police power is sort of the, a, a broad general power. It's the power of municipalities to enact laws for the general welfare within the scope of their authority. The zoning power is actually a subset of the police power. But generally when people talk about either using the zoning power or using this more general power, they group it into the two categories of either using the police power or the zoning power. And uh, what we found is that there are a few circumstances where passing ordinances pursuant to the, either the zoning power or the more general police power um, makes a difference. One of them is in the case of moratoria. So if you're passing a moratorium, Pursuant to the police power, there's sort of a very high standard. It must be in response to a dire necessity, reasonably calculated to address that necessity, and the municipality must be taking steps to study or fix the problem. It's a very stringent standard, but I think the idea behind it is that it encourages municipalities not to continually enact moratoria, but to deal with whatever issue um, that the, is the subject of the moratoria, moratorium. Um, then, um, you know, if you pass a moratorium pursuant to the zoning power, the standard is a little bit different. There you can pass um, an ordinance that is a stopgap measure while updating your zoning code. But again, there needs to be action on the part of the town board. Um, with bans, there's really no difference in terms of the standard for passing either a ban or moratorium, uh, uh, sorry, for passing a ban, whether you're using the police power or the zoning power. In that case, uh, the ban is permissible as long as it's reasonably related to a legitimate government interest, which is a really easy bar to meet. And one thing I'll note here is though, even though the, the Dryden and Middlefield cases both dealt with towns that had zoning ordinances, our understanding is that the reasoning of those opinions would apply equally to a town that is acting using their police power. So in other words, a town would not have to adopt a zoning code in order to pass a ban or a moratoria, or even a town that, that had a, a zoning code may not even need to use the zoning power. It may be, be, able, it may be able to use um, its police power. The last subject I'm gonna talk about, and I'm gonna talk about this very quickly, uh, comes from the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution. And for those who are big fans of the Constitution, you'll know that the Fifth Amendment is a really, really important amendment. It's not only the amendment that gives us uh, the liberty not to testify against ourselves in court and plead the Fifth. It is also an amendment that um, prevents the deprivation of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And importantly for our discussion tonight, um, it is also the amendment that makes sure the government cannot take private property for public use without just, without just paying just compensation. Now this clause right here that's highlighted, that's known as the takings clause. And originally what it applied to were scenarios where the government came onto your land and either physically occupied your land or physically took your property. And the idea is, you know, whatever they took, they would have to pay you fair market value for. At some point in the early 20th century, the Supreme Court decided that there are also sometimes laws or regulations that are so onerous that even though they may not entail the government physically coming onto your property and taking your land, it is basically the same thing. And in those situations, the government that enacted that law or regulation needs to pay fair market value for what was taken. Um, I won't talk a lot about takings claims because they are, takings law is notoriously confusing with respect to regulatory takings. It's notoriously muddy and it's also very site specific. So a takings claim in town A is not going to be the same claim as a takings claim in town B. It's going to be very fact specific. Uh, what I will say is that um, we do anticipate that there will be more takings claims in the future. 
And um, we do believe that there are a number of viable defenses that towns can raise in order to defeat a takings claim based upon a ban or a moratoria. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to John, who's going to talk about our work in the other two town board scenarios. I'm John Chris. I'm an attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council. I work on the community fracking defense stuff with uh, Dan and Betta. And I'm going to be talking about the second half of the work that we do, which is the work that we do in towns that are not as supportive of people who are opposed to fracking, towns that are either neutral on the issue that haven't made up their mind, or towns that are pro-gas. So the first part of this is our work in towns that haven't made up their mind, towns that are neutral. And the main focus of our work in towns that are neutral is with citizens groups who want to understand what that neutrality means, who want to understand what the law is if no changes were made in their town. So from us at NRDC, that means that citizens groups often come to us and ask us to evaluate the local laws that they have already on hand, the land use regulations they already have on hand, and if they have a zoning code, to look at that zoning code, to answer the question for them whether or not, if God forbid fracking were legalized, in the state tomorrow, whether that would mean that fracking could automatically come to the municipality or whether there would have to be steps taken by the municipality to enable that to happen. Now, we've noticed in many towns across the southern tier and across the state that despite there never having been a ban or a moratorium on fracking actually put into place, the zoning codes and the land use codes that go back 10, 20, 30 years effectively bar fracking, oil and natural gas development, and heavy industry generally. You normally see something along the lines of a provision saying, these are the things we allow in our town, you can use your land in this way, everything else is prohibited. A lot of towns do this to keep out more traditional industrial activities. But given the decisions in both Middlefield and Dryden and the appellate decision, that would be equally viable against fracking. Now, Another element of helping citizens understand what the law is in their town is reviewing comprehensive plans. And when, town, uh, when towns and localities exercise their local land use authority, they have to do this consistent with a comprehensive plan. And if they do something with their local land use authority that's inconsistent with a comprehensive plan, well, then it can be struck down. So another element of what we do is we review comprehensive plans to help give citizens an understanding of whether or not, even if their town went forward with a pro-fracking ordinance, that would be acceptable under the current comprehensive plan that they have. Now, the second part of helping citizens just understand what the situation in their town is, understand what the law is, is we help citizens groups draft and defend FOIL requests. FOIL is a very important statute, freedom of information law, and it allows citizens and citizens groups to ask questions, essentially, of their government. And NRDC, one of the major things that we do is we help citizens group draft these. We write them jointly, and, if necessary, we're willing to defend the FOIL requests that are made. If you make a FOIL request and the agency denies it, and they deny it upon appeal to the agency's head, well, then you have options. You can bring an Article 78 claim, as it's known, uh, basically a lawsuit arguing that, no, their denial wasn't proper. They should have given us this information. We have a right to it as citizens. And that's something that we help people do. Now, another focus uh, of our work in towns that are neutral, that haven't made up their mind, is helping people push for protections. And there's a couple ways that we do that. And I better talked about this a little bit, but one of the major things that we do is we help people draft petitions, just generally speaking, petitions to the town board to have them adopt either a ban or a moratorium. And we also help review, like I said, their local laws to see if there are any provisions of the local law that might help them do this. And this is something we have seen in a number of local laws. We've seen a number of local laws, land use laws, zoning codes, and the like, that allow a certain percentage of the people that live in a town or the people that live in a district to petition for that town or that district to adopt a certain regulation. In this case, it would be a ban. And if you have such a provision in your local law, usually the town board is obligated to give you an answer. Without that provision, the town board could ignore it, but there are occasionally situations where the town board is obligated to give you an answer. And so we can help, we can help citizens groups identify whether their town has such a provision and help them take advantage of it. Now, we also help in neutral towns with enforcing the law that already exists. If you are in one of these towns that has a, a, a zoning code or land use regulations that ultimately prohibit fracking or would prohibit fracking, but the town board has no interest in actually enforcing them, 
Well, there's a mechanism in the town law. There's a mechanism in New York state law to allow citizens groups and citizens, resident taxpayers of the town, to enforce those laws, to make sure that everybody in the town is playing by the same rules. Now, that is the New York town law section 268.2, and that basically requires that if the town is refusing to act on its own law, you demand the town to act on its own law. If they refuse again, then any three resident taxpayers are allowed to essentially step into the shoes of the town and enforce their laws on the violator. So that's our work in towns that are neutral. And I'd like to turn now to our work in towns that are a little bit more in favor of gas drilling or explicitly in favor of gas drilling. And there's, there's three elements of our work in towns that are explicitly in favor of gas drilling. And the first, and I think the most important, is keeping the debate open, making sure that no matter what the outcome, ultimately the process is fair, open, and democratic. And there's a couple elements of New York law that we work with and that citizens groups work with that allows them to keep that process open. The first and perhaps most important is the open meetings law. This is a very important statute. Some of it is up there. But the heart of this law is basically that when a public body is deliberating amongst itself or making decisions, those meetings have to be open to the public. They have to be something you can attend. They have to be something you can hear. And generally, this law has been construed relatively broadly to require uh, open decision making. And we've seen towns that have skirted the line on this. And part of what we do is help citizens groups bring that to the attention of the town. And if necessary, bring a lawsuit about that because you do have a right to open public meetings. Now, what you'd be looking for in a town that was violating this is you'd be looking for a persistent pattern of activity of an agency or a town board trying to shut the citizens out to make sure that they couldn't see what was going on. And there's no silver bullet on this. These cases are usually very fact dependent, but you'd be looking for things like intimidation, you know, packing the meeting room with supporters, deliberately being inaudible, having unreasonable starting times, picking spaces they know are far too small, not giving sufficient notice things like that. And so one of the elements of our work and one of the ways that the law protects citizens groups is if you have a town that's doing that, well, that's ultimately against the law and there's an opportunity to challenge that. Now, another element of the open meetings law is that there have to be public notices of when the town's board is meeting. This has to be, if the meeting has been scheduled for more than a week in advance, posted within 72 hours of the meeting in the news media and posted in a place uh, designated for the public. And then the final element of the open meetings that I'll talk about is that filming is permitted during town board meetings, and in fact, during any open meeting. It is protected by the open meetings law, and it has been vigorously defended by the Committee on Open Government. You have a right to take a camera and to videotape them. I know uh, the advocates for Morris have been doing that. We actually recommend that everybody do that when they're going to town board meetings, but that's another key element of this statute. Now, the other element of keeping the debate open, and I'm sure some of you have heard of this, is the First Amendment. Uh, we have recently won a victory in the town of Sanford. We were able to take a town that had passed a resolution saying that during their town board meetings, people were allowed to comment to the town board on any subject they wanted except for fracking. And we brought a lawsuit arguing that that violated the First Amendment, and we were uh, successful in that the town board withdrew the resolution, and now the debate is open again. Now, I should be clear that the open meetings law doesn't require them to hold meetings at which you're allowed to address them. But if they choose to open a forum, if they choose to invite public comment, well, then they're bound by the First Amendment. And when they're bound by the First Amendment, they're not allowed to unreasonably restrict debate. And so that's something that we've seen, and it's something that we've been helping people fight. Another element of working with citizens groups in hostile towns, in pro-gas towns, is policing the process if, again, God forbid, these towns ever actually decided to go forward and take their preferences and make them law, make fracking legal in the town. The most important statute in this area is the State Environmental Quality Review Act, a secret. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. This is a key statute. It's a key statute in uh, and ensuring that the decision making being made by agencies across the state is consistent with environmental health and human health. Now, this statute applies absolutely to the actions of local government authorities. And it applies to almost any action that a local town board is going to be taking 
if and when it decided to move forward with fracking. So it's going to apply to things like land use law adoption, zoning code adoption, comprehensive plan adoption, as land use law changes, zoning code changes, site plan approvals, variances, special use permits, basically almost anything you can think of could be an action that might be under seeker. Now, if a town is doing something that's covered by Seeker, the bare minimum is that they have to prepare what's known as an environmental assessment form to basically answer the question of whether there's any likely significant environmental impacts. If the answer is yes, they have to prepare a full EIS. They have to address those impacts, address alternatives, address mitigation. If the answer is no, then they're done and they can go forward. Important to note about the fracking context is that when you are making a change to land use laws, or you're making a change to zoning codes, or you're making a change to comprehensive plans, well, that's what's known as type one actions. And under Seeker, a type one action is an action that carries with it a presumption that whatever you're doing is going to have a significant environmental effect, and therefore you have to go through the whole process. It's definitely not a guarantee, but it's a hard presumption for them to overcome. And so this is something to watch for. If your town board, if your town decides that it wants to go forward with fracking and it starts passing laws to that effect and they're not obeying Seeker, there is a very real chance that you have a cause of action there and a way to make sure that they obey the process and possibly even shut them down. Now, the key to Seeker, and this is the last word on Seeker, the key to Seeker is reasonableness. That's the question that will be asked. Is their answer to the question about whether there are any likely environmental effects reasonable? Are their mitigation proposals reasonable? All the alternatives they considered reasonable? Things like that. Meaning that unlike, say, an open meetings law case or a First Amendment case, if a town board were to go forward and say, well, we're legalizing fracking in the entire town, but no, 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 there's no environmental impacts there. The test is reasonableness, which is a test that I think is relatively favorable in this context. Now, another element of making sure that this process is done right, if ever it is done, is 239M referral. This is another place that it's possible for citizens, citizens groups to police what's going on and possibly stop it if the law is not obeyed. 239M referral is going to require that if a town is taking an action, usually land use, zoning, or comprehensive plans, that it run that action by the county. The county can either approve, recommend modifications, or it can reject. And if it, if it offers modifications or it rejects it, then the town board is going to have to pass it by a majority plus one. So it increases the certainty, the, the amount of votes that would have to be on the town board for that to happen. Important to note in this is that while you can challenge a failure to do 239 M referral, and if they fail to do it, the law is void, absolutely, the court will throw it out. This is something that has to be done within four months in the third department. Now, Otsego County is within the third department. A lot of counties in the southern tier are. But where we're sitting right now, if you see a town board going forward with fracking laws and they don't follow 239M, this is the kind of thing that would have to be acted on very, very quickly. Now, the final element of policing the process, and that's something that we in citizens groups are always looking out for, is conflicts of interest. Basically and quickly, an elected official is not allowed to vote on a matter if they are going to have direct monetary, pecuniary, or material gain from it. Obviously, there's a lot more detail to that, and it's very fact-specific. But, for example, if you have a town that is passing a resolution that will directly allow someone on the town board to make money via fracking, there's a decent chance that's a conflict of interest, and that's something we would want to review. Now, the final element of our work in pro-gas towns is, is pushing back if they do decide to go forward with fracking on the ground. The first element of that is something that the town law provides us again. This is called a protest petition. If a town board decides that it's going forward with a land use law or a zoning law and 20% 20, er, of the owners of property, either in the area where they're changing the rules on, or in the area across from, or adjacent to the area that they're changing the rules on, object in writing, well then that forces them to have more votes to pass that. It's a decent way to stop a town board that is uncertain if you can get the 20% of signatures. It's just a mechanism that the town law provides to protect yourselves. And then the other two challenges 
to actually going forward with granting someone the specific ability to put a well in the ground would be if they grant a site plan approval, well, that's challengeable. It's challengeable under seeker. It can be challengeable under local and state law. That's something that would have to be done within 30 days, but it's challengeable. If they decide to go forward without a site plan approval, granting a use variance, that's also challengeable. The standard there is unreasonable hardship which is a very difficult standard for someone in this context to meet. So if they go forward with a use variance in the context of fracking, that's again something that citizens groups should be aware of, should be looking to challenge, and something that we're interested in helping you challenge. Now that's, that's been a very quick overview of some of the work that we do and some of the opportunities that the law provides for people to fight back, push back a little bit on this issue. If you see anything that I've talked about, that we've talked about, that you think you might have uh, something to discuss with us. We're more than happy. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to sit down and have a talk with you. My name is Teresa Winchester, and I'm a resident of the town of Butternuts. Um, I have a theoretical question. Um, say a town is passing a ban on fracking and say either uh, a town board member or the spouse of a town board member uh, has a business which develops alternative energies. Would that be considered a conflict of interest? The answer to that question is, in every case with conflicts of interest, much longer than yes or no. It is, a conflict of interest case is a very, very fact-specific question, and it really does turn on whether or not they're going to gain direct monetary or material benefit from it. Based on only what, what uh, the situation is as you said it, I'm not entirely sure, but it's definitely something that we would like to hear more about. But ultimately, every one of the conflicts of interest questions that might come up is going to be very, very fact dependent. And the kind of thing that would actually need, we would have to sit down for a little while and talk about the situation, which we're happy to do. Dan, do you have anything? The only thing I would add, in, in certain cases with conflicts of interest where there's been a lot of um, inappropriate activity on the part of the board, sometimes the appearance of a conflict can be enough. But again, as John said, these cases, conflicts of interest cases, are really, really fact specific. I'm Kenneth Fogarty. I'm from the town of Guilford in Shenango County. And I'm very interested in that 239M review. Uh, should you get a negative uh, response from the county? And uh, I understand that that response has to be very narrow. It has to relate to uh, countywide uh, negative impacts or negative impacts on uh, adjacent towns. So if it comes back without a proper rationale, uh, what options does the town board have? I know you said a, a, four, a, plus, a, a four out of five majority. However, that four would be necessary if there was any rational basis for the county's reply. So uh, uh, on legal advice from an attorney who I'll leave uh, unmentioned said, well, there are really two pathways. One is you can challenge the county and then you have to, uh, you have to be uh, on the offense. Or the alternative is if you believe there's no content there, you ignore the county and you proceed with, even if you have a 3-2 vote, and then put the onus on the county. So that was one question. And the other question was, the meaning of the word dire that you used, uh, is there a, an imminence to the dire, or is there not? I think in the Binghamton case, uh, the judge uh, indicated that you have to have uh, 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 some reasonable feeling that there is an imminent danger. Whereas, uh, and that's still being challenged, I think that's also in the appellate case. So can you comment on both of those? Absolutely, thank you. Uh, I'll take the first part, because I know a little bit more about that, and then I'll turn it over to Dan for the second. In answer to how a town board would go about arguing that the county's use of 239M refusal was improper, I would say that that would be the second. I would say that the town, if it believed, and it had good legal advice, and I would also recommend legal defense, if it had good legal advice on that, should pass it with the 3-2 majority and be prepared to defend it. Yeah, and, and just to add another comment on that, there's there's an actually an active, or what, it, what will probably be an active case on this uh, currently, so 
I mean, this area of the law, I think, is there. There haven't been uh, there hasn't been a lot of case law on this particular question, although that's something that will probably be be um, flushed out in the future. With respect to the question about the the standard for passing moratoria um, under the police power, I would say yes. In most cases, it has to be a threat that's that's in, in, um, imminent, um, but recognize that there is, you know, an imminent threat doesn't mean an imminent problem. It's just the threat of that problem. Um, but it is a relatively um, stringent standard. And like I said, it's, you know, it's a little bit confusing that the standard for passing a ban is much more lenient than for passing a moratorium. It's actually, it's, it's quite confusing. But I think the idea with, with that standard that was developed by the courts was really to push municipalities to either address the issue, and if they needed more time to address a particular issue, they could pass um, a, moratoria, a moratorium, but um, uh, to, so to really compel action to either pass a ban or to take other action and not to continue to pass moratorium after moratorium after moratorium. Uh, my name is Lottie Marsh. I live in Sydney, New York. I have two questions, well, three, which includes give me all your phone numbers. Um, the first one is our comprehensive plan, <clears throat> excuse me, was adopted in 2003 for light industry only and um, a push to remain an agricultural area. Sorry, can, did you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, when an comprehensive plan is adopted, what is required uh, to change that? Like we're in a pro area and I have overheard um, comments made that we'll just change the comprehensive plan. What is legal? How is that done legally? And the second question is, um, you referred to 20% of a town do you mean 20% of acreage, or do you mean 20% of taxpayers? How is that figured out? Thank you. With respect to the comprehensive plan question, um, changing a comprehensive plan is going to take action, is going to necessitate action by the town board, but the town board does have discretion to change the comprehensive plan. Just because there has been a comprehensive plan in the past, it does not necessarily cement that plan for all generations. Uh, towns, the makeup of towns change and they can change their comprehensive plan accordingly. And that's why um, it's so important to have a town board that is responsive to these concerns. Can you hear me? Excellent. And on the question of the 20%, uh, that's for the protest petition, uh, so to oppose a zoning change being made. And so that would be 20% of the owned acreage of the district, or it's going to be 20% of the owned acreage under certain specifications that's immediately adjacent or across from the parcel that's being rezoned. So it's a, it's a question of acreage and less of whether you live there or pay taxes. It's more about the land. For anyone that didn't know, uh, any legal work that the NRDC would do for you, for citizens groups, for towns, would be pro bono. We don't charge a fee. We work based on donations. Uh, and for how to begin that relationship, what we would want to do is we'd want to set up an introductory phone call between yourself and any uh, relevant members of the planning board and myself and probably my senior attorney, and that would result in a retainer if we wanted to go forward. We would definitely want a retainer to, say, review a comprehensive plan or to help draft a comprehensive plan. A retainer is just a standard form thing, but it would protect both you and us. And, and just one point of clarity, although I don't, I don't think it was actually confusing. When we say we work on donations, that's the organization as a whole is funded by donations. You do not have to donate to the organization if, if you work with us. It's completely pro bono. Okay, I have a mixed legal strategic question, and it arises from the fact that we may very well end up in a situation where fracking is permitted in the state, but is banned town by town. 
And if you live in a town that's, particularly if you live on the edge of a town that's surrounded by towns where, where fracking is permitted, uh, you may not actually benefit from having the ban in your own town. So I wonder two things. Have you thought about the, the, uh, the number of towns in an area that would have to have bans to make fracking commercially impractical in a region? And secondly, are there things in addition to bans that an individual town can do to make it less attractive or perhaps even uh, more legally difficult for fracking to occur in bordering towns? With respect to, to the first question, um, I think this is perhaps a, a little bit beyond the, the can of our knowledge in terms of determining what's commercially practicable or, or what's not. That's ultimately in the hands of the, the oil and gas companies. Although it is a, a, you know, a serious concern, a town generally has authority within town boundaries and, and they don't have authority on, uh, over neighboring towns. So um, it, is, it is a concern, activities taking on the perimeter very close to the town. And as for actions that towns can take to discourage fracking from going forward in other towns, first and foremost, I would say, is, is political. I mean, the anti-fracking movement in New York State, and really nationwide, has been driven not from organizations like NRDC, but from citizens groups and individual citizens that have really been putting their back into it and making sure that, well, in this case, the governor, but even the president are aware that his base doesn't want this to happen. So that, that, is, that is the first and most important answer to that question, is that if you live in a town that has an opinion on this, that you don't want this to go forward in the state, then the governor should hear from you as a citizen and it should hear from your board. That, that's very important. Now, legally, it's obviously much harder for a town to act against activities that are outside its jurisdiction, but there are a handful of things that one might be able to do. Off the top of my head, uh, working with the, the, there's a set aside in the oil gas solution mining law that allows a town to regulate road use that might be able to be used to prevent truck traffic. Uh, this is just an idea. There would have to obviously be a separate conversation with that town about whether that was something that was viable. But road use might be an angle. Uh, hours of operation for heavy trucks on the road possibly is an example, just to discourage it generally. But the top line answer to that question is winning the fight at the state. And I'll tell you, the towns that want fracking have told the governor how they feel. I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have seen the letters from the 21-odd supervisors begging, you know, frack us now. There should be letters from the supervisors that don't want it to happen. Follow up to the last question. Um, if you are in a town that has banned <coughs> fracking, uh, but you are on the perimeter, your property is on the perimeter of that town, adjacent to a town uh, where for fracking is permitted, uh, can you speak to what the issue is relative to the horizontal lateral line that may be drilled but f underneath you, despite the fact that uh, fracking is, is, is uh, prohibited in your town? Um, so actually, John and I had a conversation about this very issue on the way up here. And um, right now, the issue is an unsettled point of law. And John, and reasonable minds can, can disagree over what the law is with respect to this issue. Um, there are a lot of people who think that the town's land use authority only extends to surface impacts and that a town would be preempted from preventing horizontal well bores from coming into the town. Um, but there are other folks who think, well, if you know a town has the ability to regulate land use and that land also includes uh, subsurface impacts. It's something that's not completely settled, and at some point it will, will probably go to the courts. You mentioned um, uh, road use. Uh, there have been a number of towns in Otsego County that have gi given, uh, it's my impression, they've given up the ability to control their road use uh, with a firm called Delta. And uh, I don't know if this is a true statement, but I, I, I think it's true. And so... Um, have they totally given up that or not? I mean, maybe Bob knows more than I about this. this. What Clark is referring to is that towns uh, have the ability to set regulations on town roads and town roads only. They cannot regulate uh, 
city or um, state roads or county roads within their township. Uh, the county, rather than having a, as they put it, a hodgepodge of regulations in the towns, had suggested that the 24 odd uh, towns in Otsego County all sign up with an outfit called, it was a Delta, was it Engineering. Delta Engineering out of Binghamton. Um, about uh, less than half the towns agreed to do that. Basically what that did was uh, put the town's ability to speak for their roads and they, they would have the best perspective of what was good for their, their roads. It surrendered that ability to an outfit uh, based in Binghamton. Uh, when they came to our town, they spent uh, a lot of time talking about pavement management. Um, the town of New Lisbon has very few paved roads <laughs> that are town roads. Uh, and they were totally unaware of that. So they, they weren't representational for a lot of communities. Um, and the question is still open, just how much representation you get from them. And I am definitely not an attorney, so that's as far as I'm going down that road. I'm Sue Slenaric from the town of Sydney. We have passed a moratorium, and I have a conflict of interest question. You mentioned that elected officials uh, have to be careful about what they do. We have a situation in Sydney where the town board appointed three uh, members to the planning board, and three of these members, including the chairman, have recently signed a petition um, with a lot of landowners trying to overturn or challenge our moratorium. And this to me would seem to be a conflict of interest. What is your opinion on that? I think again it would depend whether there was a direct monetary interest um, at stake and whether that was something that could affect how the, the members of the planning board were, were doing their um, duty. So I'm not sure, again, it would be very fact, fact specific mm -hmm. and whether there, uh, you know, whether there's, there's an actual conflict of interest. But in New York, it's very tied to monetary gain on, a, on the part of the government actor. My only concern about a conflicts case there I'm sorry, my only concern about a conflicts case in that situation, other than the fact that they're always very fact dependent, is this is a little tied in with the fact that just by being uh, you know, somebody who serves uh, as an elected or appointed representative doesn't eliminate their ability to comment as private citizens on matters of public concern, and in many cases, their ability to comment on, on matters of public concern as public citizens. And uh, while it's possible that signing this petition gains them some sort of direct monetary benefit, I think a case there might be very difficult. Okay. I also had a question. You mentioned that the Dryden and Middlefield uh, cases are working their way up through the courts. And is it correct that at the, with the Court of Appeals, they have maybe eight or 900 um, appeals that people wish that they would hear, but they only hear less than 100? And what is the likelihood then of this even being addressed? Yeah, yeah, we, I, I thought we would get this question. I mean, the thing is, I'm trying to read the mind of, of the court it is an exercise and, you know, um, ESP and, and, and we can't really read, uh, uh, we, we don't really know whether the Court of Appeals is going to take it or not. I've talked with a lot of attorneys on this issue and there's a lot of good attorneys that think the court has just got to take this case or these cases and there's a lot of good attorneys that think there is no way that the court is going to take this case. Okay. But I, I think either way, uh, the, the law is very solid on this issue. And one of the things I didn't talk about with the Dryden and Middlefield cases is that they're based on a line of cases decided by the Court of Appeals, three, three really strong cases with respect to the mine lands reclamation law. And this is the law that deals with solid mineral mining. Um, so, you know, gravel pits and limestone and stuff like that. And the mine lands reclamation law hadn't almost identical preemption provision and in all three of those court of appeals cases the court of appeals upheld the ability of the municipalities to either locate mining operations or exclude them completely so we feel very confident that the law is going to remain as it is today and so if they don't take the the case it stands is that also correct right if yeah. they, don't they don't take, take the, the case appeal. it stands but the <laughs> precedent 
is only binding within the third department, so there is the potential that other cases could come up in the fourth department or the second department and be inconsistent, although the reasoning of the lower courts and the reasoning of the appellate of of the appellate of the third department um, is very compelling, and we think it would be very persuasive uh, to courts and other departments as well. Uh, Judy Smith, I'm from the town of New Berlin. Um, I was uh, wondering, I live not far from state land. If Governor Cuomo were to okay um, permit fracking in New York State, can gas companies come on state land and drill? Gas companies cannot come on state land, either um, the surface or the subsurface, um, regardless of compulsory integration. Um, they cannot come onto state land unless they have a, a contract with the state, a lease with the state. And whether they can or can't have a lease with the state depends on what type of state land it is. Um, and there are certain types, I'd, I'd have to refresh my memory, there are certain types of state land that you could not have fracking operations on, and there are certain types of state land where it would be permissible, and then there's types of state lands where probably surface activities would be impermissible, but maybe subsurface horizontal wellbore would be, and there's a bunch of different types of state lands, and it would depend on, on what type of land it was. David Hutchison, Environmental Board for the City of Oneonta. Is it true that subsurface rights take precedence over surface rights? In other words, if one owns the mineral rights subsurface, you can do whatever is necessary on the surface to recover those minerals. A lot of these rights are uh, determined by contract, although at common law, uh, mineral rights or mineral estates, you, well, well, I guess first let's back up. There are two types of ways that a company can gain um, access to mineral rights. They can either have a lease of the mineral rights, which is the most common in New York, or there can be a split estate where the, the mineral rights is, are, are actually owned as sort of a separate property interest. In those cases, the, the rights of the, person, the, the people who own the um, mineral estate are determined more by common law, and generally at common law there's an easement to the surface estate. I don't think, it, I think, I'd have to, I'd have to look at it again. I think it's, they would, they have a right to do what is reasonably necessary, and the key word there is reasonably necessary to extr extract the resources, and reasonable people can disagree about what is reasonably necessary. With, with leases, it is generally more governed by the specific terms of that lease. So whatever rights the company has are, is going to be determined by that document. And in the context of compulsory integration, uh, if, if a land were compulsorily integrated, if the gas under your property were compulsorily integrated, the DC's opinion currently is that if you've been compulsorily integrated, they can sink a well bore under your property, but that they're not allowed to cross the surface of your property. Follow up the compulsory integration. If gas drilling occurs in New York State, what efforts are going on to challenge compulsory integration? Right now, we're, we're looking at compulsory integration and, and potential challenges that can be um, lodged against um, or by owners who do not want to be compulsorily integrated into a spacing unit. The law itself does not leave a lot of room for objection from these owners. And so far, we have not seen a constitutional angle or another type of angle where this law would, would perhaps be invalid. Going back to the, the takings concern, um, generally the way these laws operate is they guarantee some sort of compensation for folks who are compulsorily integrated into these spacing units, and that is generally good enough for the Constitution, although that being said, this is, this is an issue we are looking into, and we are looking for, for avenues of, of challenge. I, I, I agree with that, and I would also say that one of the projects that is currently in the works at NRDC is looking into all of the aspects of the oil and gas industry and fracking specifically that are undemocratic, that are forceful. Compulsory integration is one of those things that even if we think that the law is behind it constitutionally, that we intend to be criticizing. And 
And yeah, and I think so far, the in terms of the best solution for um, um, changing the compulsory in integration law or protecting landowners that don't want to be compulsorily integrated is legislative change at the state level. I was fascinated by something that was uh, stated during the presentation. Uh, I believe, if I understand correctly, it was said that if a town is violating its own rules, um, that there is a provision that allows uh, people, three people perhaps, to somehow enforce the laws that are being violated. Can you elaborate upon that? I'm happy to. Uh, yes, there is such a provision. Uh, let's not overstate what it does. I may have glossed over it a little bit, but uh, the provision allows that in the situation where a town has a land use law or a zoning law, that you know, is applicable to somebody, but the town is choosing not to enforce it against that person for some reason. Well then, a resident taxpayer of the town can make a written demand to the zoning enforcement officer, the land use code enforcement officer, and if they refuse to act after a written demand within 10 days, then three resident taxpayers of the town and of the district that the violation is occurring in can bring a suit against the person who's violating as if they were the town, essentially a suit to enjoin them from that activity. So it does exist, it's mostly in the context of land use and, uh, and, and zoning, so it would be only those rules. And there are some uh, minor technical details about who can bring it, but ultimately, yes, if the town is refusing to enforce its own zoning laws, then there's an opportunity for citizens of the town and of the district to make them. Uh, John Davis from the town of Middlefield. Uh, could you, I don't know if you can clarify this or not, but the question of the uh, home rule is now working its way through the courts. What are the roles of the legislative branch and the executive branch related to home rule? How is this going to all play out? There are roles to play for the, the legislative and the executive branch on this issue. So I guess starting with the executive branch, one of the things um, that that it can do, particularly the Department of Environmental Conservation, is that they can recognize um, the decision of these courts and recognize the ability of municipalities to exclude fracking activities if they so choose. I believe earlier it was DC's opinion that municipalities did not have these rights, although it would be nice to have that formal recognition um, from the department and perhaps from the governor himself. Um, with respect to the legislature, I think right now um, municipal authority over gas drilling is, is relatively strong in New York, although the, the legislature can sort of remove all doubt by codifying the holdings of these lower court opinions with respect to gas drilling and maybe even make clear that municipalities also have rights to regulate other land use concerns such as noise, dust, air, light in communities that might might want to have some oil and gas drilling but want to to control traditional land use aspects. The question was um, what would the ban, a ban in a town or moratoria in a town, what impact would that have on currently permitted vertical drilling? Was that your, did I phrase that correctly? Okay. Well, I think the answer here is that it's sort of an unsettled question of law. So it's our belief that it would be possible to have a ban of just high volume horizontal drilling, although the concern there is if you're just banning a particular activity such as high volume hydraulic fracturing, that is regulation of the oil and gas industry and would be preempted by the OGSML. However, we think there are significant differences between vertical fracking and horizontal fracking, significant differences that relate to land use, that relate to the size of the well pad, that relate to the number of truck trips, that relate to how often they're fracking these wells. I mean, if you think about a horizontal well, you have um, a well that, that can have eight to 12 separate well bores instead of one. And each of those well bores can be fracked and they all require um, you know, a lot of truck traffic and the drilling time and the fracking time. So it's a very different sort of land use and we think that would justify a, a high volume hydraulic ban versus a low volume ban, although it is, um, it is unsettled. 
the question was, what did the town of Avon, Avon's ban on drilling uh, with a grandfathered clause for vertical wells, what impact did that have on the, or what relevance did that have on the recent court decisions uh, regarding Middlefield and Dryden? Yeah, I think the difference there in terms of grandfathering in um, old wells, that's just a common uh, technique. A lot of times when there are wells already in the ground, and I didn't, I didn't talk about this, uh, there's a separate concern. Sometimes people who already are engaging in a use have a vested right to engage in that use, and the state or a municipality cannot stop them from engaging in that use. So that's a, a slightly different concern than um, either banning a particular type of drilling or a particular type of well. Um, but yeah, so that's. We just want to send this message to Governor Cuomo that we want to ban fracking and we want to instead choose renewable energy, which I think is such an exciting and hopeful message. And I don't know if people are familiar with the Jacobson plan, uh, but this report that came out a couple of months ago, people, if you're interested in that, you can also email me about that. Uh, basically, it's a plan from Mark Jacobson of Stanford, who has created this model for how to get New York State to run entirely on renewable energy by 2030, which would create millions of jobs, including 58,000 permanent sustainable jobs in our state. So that gives me a lot of hope. Um, also, just want to plug an initiative that I've been working on for the past year, Businesses Against Fracking. So for those of you who are business owners or are friends with your you know, local diner owner or realtor or hair salon, uh, we have these great decals out front and you can basically put it in your window, Business Against Fracking, and sign on to this initiative. There's a website that we launched a couple of months ago, Businesses Against Fracking NY com that you can go on and check out. We have over a thousand businesses signed on. And again, it's just, you know, a great initiative to raise awareness in your community. And I know there's some fear with not wanting to come out, you know, against fracking as a business owner. But the more people that do and the more that we can show that we are in the majority, um, you know, in the anti-fracking fight, the more powerful we'll be. So anyway, thank you all so much for coming. And I don't know if Dan or John have anything else that they wanted to add but um uh just just the one thing uh we'd been asked for our phone numbers and <laughs> i think we can probably give those out uh my name is john Croix, j-o-n-k-r-o-i-s and my my phone number uh, is 212-727-4410 call me anytime um and my name is dan rochelle and my last name is spelled um very oddly, it's spelled R-A-I-C-H-E-L, and my phone number is the same as John's with the exception, uh, the exception of the last four digits, so it's 212-727-4455, um, and um, I think both John and I would like to thank you all for coming out tonight and listening to us speak. I just want to say, in Scientific America, in the April edition, they have uh, uh, an article on which is energy in and energy out. And natural gas is rather low, and they didn't define um, how the natural gas was extracted. And I intend to call the author up and find out. But the nice thing about it was that it was only one point above um, solar energy, and there was a recent uh, a mention, I think, by Governor Cuomo about a company that has uh, patented the ability to paint on uh, electrical coatings on plastic so they don't need high temperature, and that should reduce the cost of uh, solar panels by 50 to 60 percent. That's very exciting. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you again. And that's a really good, great point. Um, I know the woman who I was visiting today, who I said was the sheep farmer turned fractivist, she has solar panels in her, you know, on the side of her farm. And she also has geothermal. 
And, you know, it's very exciting that this is starting to take off. And I know that companies like Sungevity have like a leasing program where you don't even have to put any money down and you can get solar installed on your house. And I think a lot of uh, local, there's a lot of local companies doing the same thing. I'm happy to see uh, these young people, young to me anyway, uh, up here willing to donate so much time and effort uh, in this cause. And those of you who have uh, reluctant town boards, I don't think uh, they can any longer say that they don't have information available to them. Uh, and if you have a town board like that, I would urge you to ask them to get in contact with these individuals and their organizations. And uh, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to come here and putting on this presentation for us. It was free to get in. It's $5 to get out. <laughs>